on May 25th, 1992, approximately at around 7.34 a.m., I was born. <laughs> I weighed about three kilos with no special health defect, except for the abnormally large head, which, as you can see right now, my body did not find a way to grow into in the last 24 years. As a former Marine who has endured the negative 20 degrees Celsius in the cold mountains and a rough life in the barracks filled with testosterone-charged males, I did, not con I did not consider myself as mentally vulnerable. As a relatively social individual with 2,155 friends on Facebook <laughs> and a boy who has often received a note and heart-shaped chocolate from an anonymous on Valentine's Day. I never thought of myself as a loner. By the way, I've kept all the notes. As a 24-year-old student with no record of any serious illness except for the surgery I had on the back of my head when I, after, I, after I split it open after banging it repeatedly on the ground because my own legs could not support the weight of my own head, I never thought of death as something that is imminent. However, on, April, on Monday, April 4th, 2016, at around 8 a.m., I was on the verge of a breakdown, longing for someone to talk to, and only a few hours away from crossing the stikes. Let's roll back a few hours. At around 3 a.m. on the same day, I was sitting on the kitchen floor, leaned against the refrigerator, staring blankly at the wall. Despite having slept three hours the night on previous night and another three hours the night before, I could not fall asleep. I had huge dark bags underneath my eyes and felt the stabbing sensation on my head every now and then. Despite having all these signs of serious sleep deprivation, I could not sleep because when I closed my eyes, my heart would start pounding the thought of duties of the upcoming week would wiggle its way into my head, and the painful memories of the past would haunt me. So I decided to take a walk. <clears throat> the air outside was brisk and chilly. The streets were empty, except for a few early birds with fluorescent jogging suits tearing through the quiet. The baristas at the Starbucks were hustling to open the store on time, and there was already a line of customers who decided that caffeine was absolutely necessary for them to start their day. I walked into a CVS, bought a bottle of Tylenol, and continued the walk. At around 6.30 a.m., I went into a small bagel store, ordered a bacon egg sandwich, along with a cup of coffee, and sat down. I opened the bottle up, and started gulping down the pills by force. I took a bite of the sandwich, trying to take in as much as possible the beautiful combination between the crispiness of the bacon and the softness of the bagels, knowing that that was going to be the last time that I experienced this unworldly joy. Now, looking back, I cannot come up with a rational reason why I, came, I made such a radical decision. I have a family and friends who love me dearly. I am at a school that has been my dream ever since I sat down on the bench near the Dog Green Chapel on a beautiful fall day, watching the leaves fall and listening to the chimes resonating through the campus. I am suffering financially as much as any other Georgetown students sitting here right now are. There was no extenuating circumstance that, circumstance that would answer the question, why did you try to kill yourself? But that is where danger, the danger lies. It can happen to anyone, anytime, for any reason. Let me say that again. It can happen to anyone, anytime, for any reason. It is extremely difficult on an ordinary day to imagine ourselves the end of our own existence. The reason for this is that as long as we've had a conscious, we've always been a living being. We do not know ourselves as dead. This difficulty of imagining ourselves as dead plants in us this, this false illusion of ourselves as everlasting entities that are insulated from it. 
This false sense of invincibility, however, is not by any means physical. There are so many ways that we can physically die, and I, I apologize for the gloominess of, of what I will say next, but I promise you, things will get more positive in the future, so bear with me for a little bit, please. On average, if you're underwater for more than five minutes, you're likely to lose your consciousness and drown. A bite from a wrong rattlesnake, if not treated, will kill you. Simply gulping down pain excessive amount of pain relievers that you can purchase at any convenience store with less than $10 can end our lives. So what stands between our life and our death is not anything physical, but our own will to live. Now the tipping point for me was neither the moment that I decided to buy the bottle of Tylenol, nor was it the moment that I started gulping down the pills. It was when I was watching the Korean ladies at the bagel store, hurrying back and forth with warm bagel sandwiches in their hands, trying to take care of the flooding orders, and making jokes at each other with Korean. They reminded me of my own mother. She would also wake up at 5.30 a.m., trying to prepare a warm breakfast and, and hearty lunch for my father, my sister, and myself. I would wake up to the clinking noise of the cooking utensils and the, tang, the salivating tangy smell of kimchi stew in the morning. If you haven't tried it, you must today. <laughs> my sister, with a lot of sleep in her eyes, would be devouring her breakfast with her left hand while packing with her right. She's ambidextrous. My father would be sitting on the floor drying his hair with a fan instead of a hair dryer because he had learned that hair dryers inflict a devastating damage to your hair density, which was noticeably thinning out day by day. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him the truth whenever he asked me, son, how does, how does my hair look? I'm sorry, father. <laughs> I wanted to see the scene again. I thought about my mother and how devastating the news of my death would be to her. I thought about all others who would bear the burden of my death and live on with the indelible scar that my decision would carve in their hearts. My life, though it may sound as if it is mine, is not mine alone. It is a big puzzle composed of little pieces that belong to everyone who has endeared me and who, reversely, finds the strength to live on through the ups and downs of their lives with the knowledge that there are people like me who support and care for them. This moment of realization was my tipping point. But wait a minute. Have I not already known that my family loves me dearly? Have I not already had the cozy, warm feeling of being a part of a supportive group? Have I not received text messages from my housemates that night asking me where I was, Neville's 05? I knew how much others cared for me, yet still made the selfish decision to dump an enormous pain on them. So why? My doctors have told me that I am genetically predisposed to commit suicide because I lack the hormone called serotonin, which is responsible for maintaining my mood balance. I have been walking back my life with my therapist trying to identify any catastrophic event that may have led me to become suicidal. I do believe that all these are part of a complex answer. However, given how blessed my life has been, both materialistically and emotionally, I knew that my depression was caused not by something intensely personal, but by something larger at work. On top of this, I also knew that I was not the only one whose outward comfort in life and promising future failed to fight off the inexplicable despair of depression. Now, let me back up my statement with some numbers. Between 1999 and 2014, the rate of suicide in the US has increased by 24% and has reached the highest point in the last 30 years. It is, now the number, it is now the 10th leading cause of death in the US, ahead of car accidents, and second among the people between the age of 15 and 24. 
more young people and teenagers die from suicide than they do from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defect, stroke, influenza, pneumonia, and lung, chronic lung disease combined. What is more alarming is that for every successful suicide, there are 25 attempts, failed attempts. The sharp increase in the suicide rate is not limited to the US. Now, my home country, South Korea, which is ranked as the fourth largest economy in, in Asia and 11th in the world, has the highest rate of suicide in, among the OECD countries. It is now the number one cause of death for people between the age of 10 and 39. If all those who have attempted suicide are, were genetically pre predisposed to do so, then the rate of suicide should have been high, just as high in the, our previous generation and the generation before them. Has there been a sudden change in genetics in such a way that makes us more vulnerable to suicide than our previous generation? If life duress and catastrophic events are the causes of suicide, then the rate of suicide should have been higher when tragic event, during the period when tragic events are more likely to have happened or when the standard of living was lower. How then can we explain the inversely proportional relationship between the economic success, of, the economic success and the skyrocketing rate of suicide in South Korea? The I found the answers in both medical and economic terms unconvincing. So I looked somewhere else. Emile Durkheim, a prominent French philosopher in the late 19th century, has said that suicide is a social phenomenon. It is, called by a, it is caused by a state called a norm, a sense of normlessness and detachment resulting from drastic changes in living conditions or arrangements. Now, my initial re reaction was, no, this could not have been the, re the reason for my suicide. There is no place that is more tailored for my active interactions with others than colleges. I'm surrounded by smart, kind-hearted, and friendly people who share with me similar passions in life, values, and similar, pa uh, similar life passions and values and goals. All I need to do to check up on the deteriorating hairline of my father in South Korea is a decent Wi-Fi. I'm literally fingertips away from reconnecting with my long-lost childhood friends and a drag away from finding out what my friends and what their friends have been up to lately. Thanks to such a variety of ways of connect, uh, building relationship with other people, we are now more connected with each other than we were at any point in the history of our mankind. Or are we? Does your bond with your friend become stronger when you're one of the 256 people who's liked your friend's new profile picture, or is it just a projection of your desire to become closer with him? Do you feel closer to your friends when you receive that seven second video of him about to do a bungee jump? Or is it a self-convincing false illusion of you thinking that you know what your friend's life is like? Does having the option to video chat with your sister same, uh, allow you to give her valuable advice on how to politely turn down her suitors? Or does the availability actually make you push it off down your priority list below answering instant messages? Social media in our generation has become a pivotal part of our lives. The zealous pursuit to make it more easily accessible and more stimulating has made it so deeply ingrained into our lives that many of us are addicted to it without even knowing it. There are, it is estimated that there are more than 2 billion social media users representing 28% of the global population. Users between the age of 15 and 19 spend about three hours a day on social media. 18% of social media users can't go, on, can't go on a few hours without using Facebook. 
a normal smartphone user on average has 7.4 communication or social apps on their phones. And 28% of iPhone users check their Twitter feed before getting out of the bed in the morning. If these numbers are not convincing enough, let's try this. It is about 2.15 in the afternoon. Please raise your hand if you have used any of the social media that you will see on the screen, either through your cell phone, laptop, today. Oh. <laughs> They're missing a slide. <laughs> but the social medias are Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, LinkedIn. Come on, raise your hands. Raise your hand. Let's go, let's go. Yep. Me too, as you can already see. Now, the problem of social media is not that we use them, or even that we use them extensively. Like I've said, social media has become a pivotal part of our life. I, for one, love social media. To be honest, on the day I posted this new profile picture, I checked it every five minutes to see how many likes I got on it. <laughs> and yes, I do have 540 likes, and it's continuing to increase, and I'm loving every one of them. <laughs> if you have not liked it so far, you should do it today. <laughs> the danger of social media lies in that we often fail to recognize the, the beauty of our, new, our friend's new dress because we're too busy scrolling through the barrage of pictures on our Instagram. The danger lies in that we lose the opportunity to have that late night deep conversation with our roommate about Nietzsche. Because we're too busy thinking of, thinking of smart comments, witty comments, that will garner up the most amount of likes on Facebook. If, yes, and yes, I did have that conversation about Nietzsche, my freshman roommate, who's here right now with me, can vindicate for me. The danger lies in that we, we start to depend on social media for our attachment with others, connection, and sense of approval. Even more dangerous is when we, when we fail to understand why we feel so empty inside, even with all the interactions that we think we're having with others. There are two characteristics of social media that make us so addicted to it. Easy access and instant gratification. As long as you use smartphones or go on the internet, the lives of your friends and their friends and their friends are within your fingertips. Heck, you don't even have to log on every time. They already have saved your password and logged in for you. All you need to do is to hit enter. Once you're bored with the information that, once you're bored with the information that has been thrown at you, all you need to do is to find a new source of entertainment, is to, is to scroll your sc screen all the way up. You wait a few seconds looking at this anticipation-inducing cursor, and voila. You have a whole new set of juicy news to entertain, to entertain yourself with. At a certain point, in the midst of all this, you lose yourself. You see beautifully filtered pictures of your friends on Facebook at an EDM concert and start to regret your choice to stay inside to watch a movie while finishing a pint of Ben & Jerry's Half-Baked, <laughs> even though you don't really like EDM at all. <clears throat> you, you read comments praising your friends' friends' accomplishments and cannot help but to feel that you haven't achieved anything in life. You feel lonely, so you check your phone to see if anyone has sent you a message through any of the four communication apps that you have, but feel even more lonely when you don't see that red circle next to the app icons. So what the accumulation of such feelings results in is a sense of normlessness, where you start to question your standard of happiness, your value judgment of what is right and what is wrong, and your assessment of what is important in your life. Then 
comes a sense of detachment, where you start to feel that you do not belong, that you're not enough, that you're no longer loved. Now, two things have changed ever since my tipping point on that early April morning. First, I no longer judge people's outsides with my insights. Oh, don't get me wrong, I still love Facebook, like a lot. I still like people's pictures, leave comments, and in still enjoy that, that few seconds of anticipation when new news feeds are being loaded up. However, I also do know that if a paparazzi was, were to take snapshots of my life, I would have a beautiful collage of happy pictures like you see right now. Second, I became more honest with myself. There is a South Korean proverb that says, Men are supposed to cry only three times in their lives. First, when you're born. Second, when, you, when, your, when your mother passes away. And third, when your wife passes away. Now, while I confess that I've cried much more than three times within the duration of watching <laughs> this movie, I've always lived with the pressure to hold back my tear. I used to distract myself from my own reality by going on social media or blocking out my own emotion. Now, I embrace them. Let them affect me, knowing that the ability to have them at all is one of the privileges of living. There's another South Korean proverb that says, if you laugh right after you cry, you will get a hairy butt. Now, I would not be surprised if I woke up tomorrow morning looking like <laughs> this panda right here. A few months after my attempt, I woke up at 4 a.m. and started to walk to the same bagel store through the same route that I took in last April. The joggers in fluorescent suits were still running, the baristas were still serving coffee to the caffeine-deprived customers, and the CVS was still selling Tylenol. When I arrived at the bagel store, I, the, the Korean ladies were still hurrying back and forth trying to serve all the customers, not knowing that they saved my life. I sat down, ordered the same bacon egg sandwich. After fulfilling myself with the condensed form of carbohydrates, I went up to one of them, told them that they, she saved my life, that she saved me from killing myself, and thanked her for it. She looked at me nonchalantly and asked me in that typical Korean mother's way of half interrogation, half scolding, why would you do such a thing? A bit embarrassed, I answered, I know, right? I would like to take this opportunity to thank her and all those others, including you guys, who through your support, affection, and love, has forced me to ask the same question that the Korean lady has thrown up at me that day. Why would you do such a thing? My answer right now is that I would never. Guys. Life has so much to offer. Please enjoy it, cherish it, and live it. Thank you.